with uh, amazing speakers. So, so I, we, ha we have Lucina Dimeku, co-founder of She Persisted and the report author, uh, Sarah Hesterman, program associate with She Persisted and the report co-author, uh, Lilia Labidi, anthropologist and the former minister for women's affairs in the government in 2011. An NSB's journalist and teacher in journalism at the Institute of Press and Information Science, Sciences in Tunisia, and Ikram bin Said, uh, who is the founder of Tunisian association called uh, Voices of Women, Aswat Nisa, which advocates for gender equity in Tunisia. We will have designated time to address questions, uh, but you may submit questions at any time during the session. And to submit the question to our speakers, please enter your question in the Q&A text box. Our webinar comes at the same time where civil, civil organizations are preparing submissions on gender and disinformation to the Special Rapporteur on the promotion and protection of freedom of opinion and expression. And uh, there is no doubt that nowadays online platforms offer a huge opportunity for individuals to exercise their right to freedom of expression and to participate in public debates, but also there are some negative aspects that we must pay attention to, such as the spread of this mis and malinformation and hate speech. And when the purpose of such content is to exclude women from the public space or other groups of individuals because of their protected characteristics, then it becomes necessary to pay attention to this deviation and address them in a way that protects women's rights to public participation. But as the Special Rapporteur uh, on the promotion and protection of freedom of expression said in 2021, it's very important to tackle disinformation through positive measures such as digital media and information literacy, fact-checking, and other preventive tools, instead of using repressive measures in the fight against disinformation, as repressive measures often prove to be counterproductive. So let me start with Lucina, who will present the report on gender disinformation in Tunisia. Lucina, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here with you today to talk about uh, the latest in our research series called Monetizing Misogyny. We, in the Monetizing Misogyny series, look in particular at the role of digital platforms and social media in the undermining of women's rights and democracy globally. And we see an element of culpability increasingly coming very, very clear also through the Tunisia case study. Before I get started, I just also very quickly want to acknowledge and thank our thought partner, ally, and supporter in this work, Porticus. As I see one of our colleagues from Porticus being online, so thank you for being with us in this work. I will be now very quickly share my screen um, and tell you a little bit about the background for this work, and then we will dive into the details. I will pass it on to the co-author of this research, Sarah Hesterman, she persisted research associate, to get to some of the examples. But first of all, I want to say we decided to focus on Tunisia because we thought that Tunisia was a particularly heartbreaking study of how something that, as Ayman mentioned, had initially been seen as a tool for um, freedom and expressing different voices and opinion, a tool for democracy through the Arab Spring, and a tool for progressing women's rights through the Me Too movement that had a particularly strong presence in Tunisia through the hashtag Enazeda. So something that had been seen as, as something so positive then really turned into a tool for repression into the hands of an ever more authoritarian government. This isn't something that's new or exclusive to Tunisia. This is a pattern we have seen almost in every country that we have studied, where we have seen that, again, human rights defenders, women's rights groups have heavily use the social media as a way to connect and to push forward uh, issues that they thought were very important and instead found that with time uh, their voices were being silenced and repressed and social media was being used as a way to find them, uh, harass them and could be even prosecute them. 
the particular type of harm that we are looking at here is gender disinformation against women in politics. And I wanna, uh, I wanna say for us, when we talk about gender disinformation, we are thinking about something quite specific as the spread of deceptive or inaccurate information and images. And we'll get to some of the examples we share in a moment. Um, of women political leaders, journalists, female public figures. And those fake stories really draw on misogyny. And that's why, unfortunately, they end up being so uh, effective. Uh, we know that for this information that's uh, drawn and focused on bias, some of the tools and some of the solutions that oftentimes are proposed, such as digital literacy, are a lot less helpful because oftentimes, you know, the the bias ends up being reinforced uh, at a level that's very emotional more than cognitive. And therefore we need to look at different solutions and we will talk about that in a moment later in the presentation. Some of the overall research findings that we have seen uh, is that the harassment and disinformation against women in politics uh, is um, played across a couple of different uh, ways and taking advantage and really using various bias, leadership bias, portraying women as untrusty, untrustworthy, unqualified, unlikable or emotional, sexualized attacks and character attacks. Overall, the goals and impact of gender disinformation are truly going beyond the individuals attacked and really aiming at eliminating opposition, pushing women out of politics, at times even influencing foreign elections, backsliding women's rights as part of a global anti-gender movement. And the goal is ultimately to erode the democratic institutions. As the UN has reported, uh, women's rights are truly the litmus test for democracy and therefore those that aim at undermining democracy very often start with women's rights. Unfortunately, social media has proved a very powerful tool to do this type of undermining in the hands of strongman political leaders, illiberal actors supporting autocrats, um, the manosphere, a conglomerate of misogyny, sexist websites, and uh, average people get pulled in the mix. When we think about the main actors and super spreaders of disinformation and conspiracy theories, and for those who haven't read it, re written it, I definitely recommend uh, an article that came out on the Washington Post just a couple of days ago on the role of conspiracy theories uh, in, in Tunisia and um, you know how they impact more broadly foreign policy. So uh, we see digital platforms are being main responsibles also in this type of harms. And we will talk in the uh, solutions in a moment about how to make that uh, different and how to change that. And we'll pass it on now to Sarah to go into deeper a little bit the examples that are specific to Tunisia. Thank you so much, Lucina. Um, could you head to the next slide for me, please? Wonderful. So thank you all for joining us today. Uh, before we begin delving into the findings, I would just like to mention that this report is a culmination of thorough desk research, interviews, and basic social media monitoring. So throughout the research period, we gathered and analyzed evidence of barriers to women's political participation in Tunisia, the state of democracy, relevant legislation, backsliding on women's rights, digital harms facing women leaders, the media landscape, and the role of social media platforms in facilitating these harms. We also conducted primary research utilizing interviews with journalists, experts, politicians, and activists uh, to really gain a more localized understanding of these issues. Um, and we monitored, as I mentioned, social media posts mentioning women leaders on Twitter and Facebook. Finally, this report faced multiple rounds of peer review to ensure that this issue is really captured as accurately as possible within the Tunisian context. So what we found was alarming with our findings of gender disinformation and online abuse in Tunisia really aligning with overall trends um, identified in other contexts while also presenting some unique facets. 
First, we identify the women leaders who are subject to gender disinformation and online abuse, framing them as being untrustworthy, find that their morals are attacked utilizing slanderous, excuse me, slanderous stories um, and humiliating sexualized images. Furthermore, women who champion the liberal values of equality and democratic principles are deemed as traitors who support non-conservative and anti-Tunisian values. Women leaders are framed as unqualified and face attacks underpinned by misogynistic stereotypes targeted for a perceived inability to lead, as well as accusations of poor mental health. When portrayed as unintelligent, women leaders are cast as ineffective and face sexualized accusations and attacks that are framing sexuality as a quality that is incompatible with intelligence. And finally, when portrayed as unlikable, women leaders are framed as a bad influence and as misleading the public towards liberal values. These attacks are especially pronounced when targeting women outspoken on individual and sexual freedoms, equality and inheritance, and equality in decision-making positions. So these next few slides will feature brief case study examples of women leaders we identified who have experienced online abuse and gender disinformation. Following the Arab Spring, Tunisia women began utilizing social media to mobilize, but what promised to be a vehicle for social change initially has come to be a place where women are targeted for fighting for equality, speaking up for democracy, and critiquing the government. So here we have Bakr bel Hashimida, a lawyer and politician who has the Individual Freedoms and Equality Commission. Um, she has received widespread recognition for her advocacy of women's rights, family law, and LGBTQ plus issues. Her work, thus has garnered um, accusations of corruption and frames her as seeking to have a bad influence on the country and its citizens. So this may look like accusations of misleading women, uh, working against national interests and acting in an unpatriotic manner. Of her role with the commission, she shared almost every 10 minutes, there is a post that calls for murder and spreads disinformation to arouse a popular and violent movement against our work. So here we see a Twitter post accusing her of being anti-Islam with the goal of imposing this on Tunisian people and a Facebook post addressing her, calling her and her colleagues dictators and sellouts. Next slide, please. Thank you. So we also looked at Sihem Ben Sudrin, who is a journalist and a human rights defender who formerly led the controversial Truth and Dignity Commission investigating corruption and human rights violations committed by the Tunisian state from 1955 to 2013. She has faced many attacks throughout her decades long career. She has faced imprisonment and being assaulted and surveilled by police and has also experienced gender disinformation campaigns and online abuse perpetrated using social media. The Facebook posts that you see here illustrate how she is portrayed as unpatriotic, engaging in corruption, and contributing to the moral decay of Tunisia. And notable on this right-hand image is the use of the gendered moniker Madonna of the IVD, which is the Truth and Dignity Commission's acronym in French, to center her as to blame for these accusations. Next slide, please. Here we feature Fatem Kalel, the former Secretary for State Youth Affairs from 2016 to 2017 and political activist, who was targeted in a gender disinformation campaign, falsely claiming she was the granddaughter of the advisor to the president and therefore had obtained her position because of her family connections and not her qualifications. We also feature Salma Alumi Rikik, the former Minister for Handicrafts and Tourism and presidential candidate in 2019 who was the subject of stories portraying her as spending her time as minister, traveling the world, signing empty agreements, and enriching herself while Tunisian citizens lived in poverty. Next slide, please. Finally, we featured the late Jamila Kisiksi, who faced racialized abuse from social media users on the internet and follow po fellow politicians, particularly after publicly criticizing the Free Distorian Party, after which she received racist online attacks, and she has also been the subject of scandalizing false narratives. We include her as her experience exemplifies how black women in Tunisia face pronounced gender disinformation and online hate campaigns, which lay at the intersection of sexism and racism. And this is indicative of the anti-black sentiments and resulting violence, which has been fueled by social media users and the president himself. These examples highlight the use of social media to discredit women leaders, abuse them, frame them as unfit for work in the public sphere and portray them as incapable of holding leadership positions. False and damaging narratives are weaponized to attack their morals, identity, and the very values they stand for. While the attacks are targeted at individuals, the ultimate goal is to undermine progress towards gender equality and democracy 
and further entrench authoritarian power through the spread of narratives reinforcing ideas about women and their place in society. So I will hand it back to Lucina now, and we will talk through some solutions. Thank, thank you, you so thank much. you so much, Sarah. I think that those examples, you know, are very interesting and I invite you all to go and look at the research that's now available on our website. I'll be sharing the link in the chat and it's available both in English and in French. I think what comes out quite clearly from those examples is that we aren't exclusively talking about misogyny here, but we are talking about the use of misogyny as a political strategy. Not all women and not all women in politics we find have been attacked the same, particularly from these informative campaigns. It's really those that are at the forefront of the battles for women's rights and for democracy that are the targets of the most vicious and dangerous attacks. And so with this in mind, when we think about solutions, we see uh, the need for three key areas of interventions that are the ones where she persisted tries to uh, double down. The first is really a set of research that tries to look at also the digital forensics and really analyzing where those attacks are coming from, if at all possible, an area that needs to be digged into further is the one around monetization and who Who's really profiting from those, those types of attacks. I think that those are really important things. We haven't seen enough, and we haven't seen enough in particular outside of the US and Europe. We need this type of research. We need to support the women leaders. Most often we find that whenever they are attacked, they are being left uh, by themselves to men for themselves um, in the face of overwhelming political powers and in the face of overwhelming attacks, very often they are not supported by their political parties and much less receive support from social media platforms. And ultimately, the main solution that we think we need to look at and advocate for is working on safer, stronger, better digital platform standards and regulations. We have heard over and over evidence of how social media platforms, and in particular Meta among them, is the biggest and in many ways the ones that has most culpability for a lot of those attacks that we have seen in Tunisia. We have seen how they have really turned a blind eye to the abuse that's going on on their platforms, to the attacks, and very often have not put the right amount of resources uh, outside of Europe and in particular in the MENA region and for the Arabic language when it comes to content moderation, to fact checking and so on. Over and over we have seen social media platform prioritizing profit over safety. Again, when we hear these days about threads from Meta being, you know, the friendlier version of, uh, of Twitter, I just want to remind everyone of the incredible harm that we have seen happening all around the world against women leaders and women in politics on Facebook, which is the largest actor in many of those countries, re resourcing very little those crucial areas, failing to address this information. And I think that when we look at also the some of the responses that social media platforms have been providing on why they couldn't act more, we need to call out the fact that women today are not free to express themselves online and that we need regulation truly as a way to support women's freedom of expression. Over and over through the interviews that I encourage you to read, we have heard women in politics and women leaders telling us that they felt they were de facto censored online when they spoke because of the incredible attacks and the danger that they faced. We see that there are a set of solutions that we'd love to be able to talk about more that are being proposed. We believe that some are stronger than others, but overall, I think that an important message that we want to come across and is that this is a global problem that really requires a global solution and a solution that needs to come in many different, in many different ways and regulation needs to be a key part of that. Thank you very much, Lucina and Sarah. 
before uh, moving to Ikram, I just also uh, want to add that uh, during the last legislative elections, uh, several uh, women candidates were subject of, um, yeah, like a sort of misleading false information with the aim to decrease or to reduce their chance or their ability to win a seat in the parliament. And now we are expecting to have local elections, I think by October, November, and also presidential elections in 2024, hopefully. And of course, we, we expect also that such kind of um, disinformation campaign with the aim to exclude women from public participation or from winning the election, is a sort of strategy that many um, actors in Tunisia are using this uh, strategy. So uh, moving to Ikram, uh, as the leader of women's right organization committed to increasing women's political participation, what do you hear from young women regarding their willingness and ability to be politically active online and freely express their opinion? Thank you very much, um, Ayman. First of all, I really want to congratulate She Persisted on this, uh, on the launch of the report. This is truly an impressive achievement. And I just want to take a moment to acknowledge the hard work expertise that was put into the creation of this report. And actually, thank you in standing in solidarity with us Tunisian women. So um, now back to your question, Ayman. I think we are witnessing in Tunisia that women activists, uh, whether political activists or feminists, uh, are uh, courageously occupying the online space, expressing freely their opinion. Uh, but unfortunately, they are being the target of, um, you know, intimidation and, uh, and abuse. And that's the, um, uh, the paradox of the uh, digital space. From one hand, it really gives us this opportunity to engage with the world and freely express our political opinion and to participate in, in public policies. But also from another hand, it exposes us to various forms of violence, abuse, and intimidation. And when I see currently the situation in, in Tunisia, and despite that the freedom of expression um, that was brought to us um, thanks to the Tunisian revolution, I see that uh, women activists and feminists, uh, they are really afraid. Uh, I can see fear again, which is very, very uh, you know, heartbreaking to see now um, activists are moving toward more closed online spaces like Signal uh, to share information, to continue being um, in touch. That few years ago, that used to be on Facebook pages and, and groups. But now I feel uh, there is really kind of, um, of fear. And uh, simultaneously, um, there is a concerning trend of women disengaging from politics altogether or imposing uh, self-censorship uh, withdrawing from uh, sharing um, opinions on public matters, sharing opinions publicly, I mean. And those are really challenges that underscore the importance of creating a safe um, and uh, inclusive environment to promote expression of, you know, different political opinions. Um, we observe also that activists and feminists who, uh, who are having um, a different opinion from the current regime are being um, uh, attacked. Uh, in a recent research done by Aswat Nisei on cyber violence targeting feminists and uh, political activists, um, the research noted that the, this phenomena, this cyber violence has actually increased after uh, July 25th, 2021. And I can share with you a few uh, examples. And I think the report really mentioned that very well. Um, women activists, and when feminists um, voiced dissenting opinions regarding uh, Qais Saeed interpretation of Article 80 of the Constitution, they have been accused of being betrayal, of serving foreign uh, agenda. Um, they were demonized and ridiculized. Um, also, another example, the disturbing experiences of prominent public figures and Feminist icons like Saneb Ben Ashur and Bushra Ben Haj Ahmida, right after really expressing their opinion, they have been victim of massive online intimidation and, and violence. And this really raised a concern about uh, what will happen to younger feminists and activists. 
Because, you know, when you attack one woman, you really attack all women. When we attack one feminist, you attack all feminists. And the message here is really, really very clear. If we go after Bushra bin Haj Hamida and Saneb bin Ashur, we are also going after you. And I think we really need to pay attention to those uh, messages behind this violence. Um, another thing is um, that in Aswat Nisa research also, uh, we noted that violence targeting women activists and feminists raises, I mean, has raised, as I said, since July 25, but it increases uh, wherever there is a big political event like elections, referendum, um, a controversial um, uh, political speech, uh, a controversial political decision. Um, and the way we target women, of course, is very different uh, the way we target men who are opposing the regime. Because in patriarchal society, if we want to go after women, we will use her family, we will use her body. So what we have witnessed in the research that intimidation, harassment, doxing, uh, invasion of privacy, revenge porn, outing, objectification of women's bodies and slut shaming. Um, and it's very important for me to really highlight this because I want to say that uh, this gender disinformation, gender disinformation is not isolated from the broad um, gender-based violence happening in real life. It is actually a continuity of that violence and it is also a reflection of state violence. And why I say it's a reflection of state violence because when the state withdraws from its primary duty, which is protecting citizens from violence, it enables and it facilitates this kind of dangerous behavior. And what is happening now to activists and to feminists in Tunisia is really showing us how misogyny is deployed to silence the women, to push them so they cannot be part of the public discourse, to keep them in line and to spread this ambiance of fear and um, hostility. And this ambiance of fear and hostility uh, is impacting everyone, men and women, but we, we use women to get into that fear. And this is why I also see that gender disinformation, it's beyond gender-based violence. It is part of it, but also it's an attack on civil and political rights, and it's an attack and democracy. And I really want us to really pay attention to the link between democracy and women's rights. So slut shaming, uh, objectification of women's bodies, the weaponization of their private lives have been always tactics used by men, enabled by the state to keep power, to hold power and to silence women. And now back to your question, I think, Yes, uh, it's quite dangerous and it's very sad, but I think activists and feminists, we really need to continue raising our voice. We need to continue uh, occup occupying the online space and being loud because the fight for women's and human rights and the fight for democracy are fight worth fighting. And I think if we are silenced right now, I think we'll be silenced forever. Back to you, Aimee. Thank you very much, Ika. Uh, thank you. I agree with you that uh, gender uh, disinformation is uh, one of the aspects of many other uh, digital or online threats, such like uh, porn revenge, um, doxing, uh, surveillance, and many other online threats. And uh, gender disinformation is one of the online threats. Um, now, uh, my question is to Lilia. Uh, dear Lilia, you have been directly involved in elective politics in Tunisia as the Minister of Women's Affairs in 2011. So how have you, how have you experienced the role of social media changing through the Arab Spring and the Me Too or NZ movement today? You are on mute, uh, Lilia. You are on mute. Okay. Thank you for your question. Is it okay? Thank you for your question. Hello. It's, it is really very important to, to know that there, is, there was a big difference before January 2011 and after January 2011. And in the same time, in the same time, women were a victim of violence and aggression even before. 2000, uh, January 2011, but also after January 2011. We had, uh, we had what we call freedom of expression, etc. But at the same time, 
we noticed that uh, particularly in during the year of 2011, you know, I what I noticed is that uh, people were looking at uh, how they will situate women, how they will react to this media or to the other one, and how uh, they will, uh, um, with whom they will work. And this idea, this idea that uh, when you are at some position, you have to work with all Tunisian, wasn't easy to make it clear for people that all Tunisian were a member of the society and you had to work with women from the city who were feminist activists involved in political party or association and with women who live in the rural area and who are really, really uh, completely dismissed, completely forget and forget by the state and also by us as a feminist, we didn't do enough, I think, and we should recognize it, it you know, um, that it, we, we should one day be able to discuss this issue, how we, uh, this uh, limitation on women who were living in rural area, which is a large, large part of Tunisia. I am speaking of, of a large part of Tunisia. <laughs> Donc, it's not only the rural area, what we call the rural area. How this, you know, I was, I, I was having, I was supposed to have meeting with women in some city uh, inside of Tunisia. And most of the time, if I had a chance to meet three or five women, I was lucky. I was lucky when my colleague, man, who was having a meeting the same day, the same moment in the other room of the institution with men, the, the room was completely full with people from different kinds of institution and also of citizenship. Donc, there is a problem, a, a very important problem that even until today, it's not resolved, that there is a racism between the region, we don't speak enough about it, there is a racism between the and with the the last event with the, um, the African our fair brothers uh, make it more clear uh, and uh, I think we should also discuss this issue. Don't my I think we should uh, think about women, feminist activists, and rural who live in rural area young people, the, uh, the, those who work in a rural area, the paysan, what we call the paysan, those who are the minority, the, minor, the minority groups are really very important and they all suffer of discrimination, of manipulation, of here, in the case of women, we have misogyny, in other cases, it will be, it, we will use it in other, word to describe. Donc it's, uh, I think it's important to take the case of women as, um, as a way to show what is happening to the other groups also. Donc it's, uh, um, for me, this is really very important not to, not to, dis to, to forget about that uh, Yes, we the women, we are an important uh, group in the society, uh, 50, at least 50%, but we have to take into account the minority groups, the others, what we call the, or what we will, they call others, like the, those who live in a rural area. When you look at the result of the exam of the Cisemane, in Tunisia this year, like it was always the case all the other years, you can see that there is a big discrimination. No, what we are saying, this is discrimination against the, this region. It's expressed by violence against women, who are, which it means also, I wanted to mention something. We should not forget that this violence against women that we are speaking about on Facebook, etc. It's not only a fact of men. 
we forget to mention this. It's also, it's also a participation of women in this kind of, uh, of and we should pay attention to who are those who are behind the screen. Are they all men or are they all, or um, women aren't they participating in this kind of debate? No, it is, I, you know, for me, it's not only white or only black. Donc, I have to think about what is happening in between and what can we do to make, to give the chance for people who, who were excluded all these times, years, this decades, etc. how they can speak. I, I remember that in the parliament, some people asked for the, to, 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 to promote a law against uh, regionalism and it wasn't accepted. No, we should not forget this. We should ask ourselves why the, uh, the La Commission uh, uh, Verité and Dignité didn't work. Why didn't work? And who did it, who, who make it impossible for this work to be achieved? Why we didn't hear the voices? I know, I know some, uh, I have uh, interviews of women who told me that women were raped in jail and in police state, etc. But it was their family, their own family, who didn't allow them to give their uh, testimony. Don't you see, things are <clears throat> much, we have, we have um, violence of the state and we have the violence of the family, we have the violence of the clan, we have the violence of the patriarchy. And this is what I wanted to, to mention when I discussed, I mentioned when reading the report, and suddenly, you know, it came clear for me, is the case of this woman judge uh, and her story and uh, how uh, they use it against her certificate of virginity to, to circulate on the web. This is something that it is so dangerous that she could be even killed by someone of her family. Don't how we can, how we can be as violent as this to do these kind of things. Don't dear, dear Lydia, I'm sorry, can you wrap up? Yes. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> no problem, thank you. Thank you very much. Before moving to Hanen, I just want to say that you can submit your question in the Q&A uh, chat box. So uh, Hanen, uh, you are a journalist and also uh, you teach uh, journalism at the Institute of Press and Information Science in Tunisia. My question is, have you uh, and your colleagues uh, also been impacted by gender disinformation? And if so, what's been um, the impact of these uh, attacks? Thank you, Ayman. Thank you, Lucina and Sarah, for your uh, study. I think that it was needed in this time because we are really facing a big problem, actually, as, as a journalist facing all these attacks against us, not only from the uh, person on the social media, but from the followers and the of the president, from the the, the from the uh, the the president supporter from the state. So uh, really, actually, let's say that uh, freedom of expression is uh, uh, threatened uh, uh, globally. So let's speak about uh, uh, the topic that uh, uh, we are discussing here, is, which is disinformation, uh, the gender disinformation. So as a woman, uh, as a female journalist, and as a lot of my colleagues, we were, it's not, it's not something new that we are victims of uh, uh, attacks on, on uh, social media. So every time that we express our uh, opinion about the government, about the politics, about uh, uh, what is happening in, in, in uh, uh, the public life, we are harassed, we are attacked, we are accused to be, uh, 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 traitor, uh, and uh, uh, we are accused to be uh, uh, against the public interest. But let's say that this kind of harassment, it becomes more after the coup d'etat of uh, 2021, 20, uh, July 2021, uh, when we discovered that uh, everyone 
that is against uh, the president uh, side, it become the uh, CIB uh, or the target of uh, uh, harassment, a virtual harassment on, on, on social media. So what we noticed, noticed that uh, there is a, a big amount of violence, virtual violence, harassment, uh, sexual violence on, on, on the, the social media. Every time that you say something that is against uh, uh, the actual president, if you are criticizing the coup d'etat, if, even if you are saying that it is a, a coup d'etat, uh, uh, directly, you are uh, accused to be uh, a traitor, to be against your 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 country, to be with the Islamist uh, 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 party who used to uh, control the, the the power in in Tunisia. Uh, uh, in, if I have to 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 give an example of myself, I was uh, attacked directly after the coup d'état because I was criticizing the coup d'état. And I discovered that new persons that are coming on my uh, page and that are starting to comment on, on my, my posts, persons that I never knew, uh, and they, are, they, are, they were very violent, they are very, uh, 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 they are trying to, uh, they are having a very ha a hate speech, Re really, uh, they are diffusing hate speech. And I think that it's not only my case, it's the, the case of, other uh, female journalists, uh, I can say the cases of uh, uh, Monia Afewi, Khawla Bukrim, uh, Shara Zedakeza. For example, Shara Zedakeza, was, she was uh, uh, um, a victim of a, a big campaign against her because she was criticizing the minister of the, 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 the former minister of the interior, and she was arrested for that. Um, so every time that you are saying something which is not in the common uh, 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 orientation of the, the power, actual, the actual power, you're systematically uh, attacked, harassed, uh, uh, and targeted. And the problem that now we are not so only targeted on social media, but we are targeted in the street. So we are uh, attacked in the street while we are uh, uh, covering the manifestation uh, against the power, uh, or even while, while we are doing our work in the street. And this is it's something new, because keeping uh, uh, diffusing this heart, this hate speech uh, uh, on social media and keeping diffusing the disinformation, gender disinformation, uh, transform us uh, uh, to uh, an ex perfect target for uh, the anti-Islamists, for the followers of the actual president, uh, for uh, the misogyne uh, persons, because we have a lot of misogyny, uh, not in the public space, only on the back public stage, but uh, in our ambient culture. So if a woman, it is she is accused in her reputation or she is accused in, 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 in uh, in uh, her uh, uh, career or, or, or he, her uh, uh, work, um, there is no one to defend her. There is no one to be scandalized uh, because of that. And this is, uh, according to me, the big problem, because if you have an ambient culture added to uh, a new environment of return of a dictatorship, added to uh, a big uh, political crisis and economic crisis, in this such an environment, there is no one to defend the, 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 um, the freedom of expression, and especially the freedom of expression of women in the public space. So to, re to reassume all of that, for us, uh, social media, uh, it becomes uh, not a safe place for us as a female journalists uh, and for a female activist as I'm uh, told, as, uh, told you about that uh, formally. So social media, it's not ever uh, a, a safe place for us. Now we are afraid to express ourselves, not only because we are afraid to be defamed or to be attacked, but now we are risking to, 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 to be put in jail because there is a new law 
the decree law of uh, 54, and Ayman knows a lot about that, that now when you are rewriting uh, even a post that criticized the actual power, you could, could be put in jail, even if you chair a post and you could be uh, put in jail. And we have a lot of journalists, female journalists, especially that are judged uh, and they have cases uh, in front of the court because they express their, their opinion. So I think now uh, uh, it's bigger than disinformation. Now the problem is the, the freedom of expression, which is threatening uh, globally. Thank you, Aim. Thank you. Thank you, Hanan. Thank you very much. Uh, so actually, I got uh, two questions. One, it's more like a general and uh, all of our amazing speakers can address it. So the first question, uh, it's what global efforts is the most needed now and uh, who needs to take action? So like more recommendations, maybe from the side of government, online platforms, tech giants, and other uh, actors. So I don't know, maybe Lucina? Sure, I can absolutely get started. Overall, we talk about the importance to really target solutions to every different country and to work, you know, depending on the context. Overall, there is definitely a place that the democratic countries have to play when it comes to creating in some ways template legislations we believe that some of the assumptions uh, you know within and and the provisions within the digital services act in europe looking at transparency from digital platforms looking at risk assessments that those are promising elements that we would like to see more of um I also think, and we also think that there is an important place to be played by civil society, really in terms of changing the conversation and demanding more accountability from digital platforms. There have been successful campaigns done by uh, high level women leaders, women politicians in responding to the sexist attacks that they received online in a way that the challenged uh, the attackers in a way that also highlighted the unfairness in a lot of these, those attacks and the undermining of democracy that was happening, you know, behind in some ways the misogyny. I think also in this respect, it's important from civil society to ask more from digital platforms. So we need a different level of campaigns that really demand a different level of accountability. And there have been throughout history uh, successful examples of that, for example, in the, in the fights and in the battles against, against tobacco. That's one of the examples that we, often, uh, that we often draw upon. And so I think that calling out uh, those that are involved in this and that that could and should be doing more is very important. When it comes to women in politics also, there is an element where I think that political parties could also be playing a different role in um, supporting the, their women leaders more, and also at the same time to have different standards of conduct for demanding different standards of contact for their party members. Depending on the country, we see really a shameless uh, set of attack against women in politics, often coming from sources that are extremely close and uh, you know, retraceable to the highest level of, of power. So th those are just some of the things that we look at and we would like to see more of. Thank you very much, Lucina. Um, I have a second question uh, to um, Ikram. So um, Ikram, during the legislative elections in 2022 and 2023, the representation of women at the parliament decreased uh, drastically. And uh, Tunisia now is currently preparing a new elections at the local level and for the second chamber. And also in 2024, we might have a presidential election. So from your point of view, what role can civil society organization play to strengthen women's representation in the political field? 
Well, thank you, Amin, for your question. I think it's very, very important question, especially for us feminists and advocates for women political participation. You know, I would say it really, it will depend on the state of the democracy in our country and the, the nature of the regime, because I am personally not a big fan of uh, throwing women in, in dictatorship, um, uh, you know, uh, to fuel the dictatorship. And I was maybe among the very, very, very few feminists uh, that raised uh, concerns about the nomination of Ms. Najla Boudin as our first female uh, prime minister in our history, because I truly believe that having seat on the table doesn't mean that you have a voice. And I think when a patriarchal dictatorship table, women, they don't have a space. We really need to bring our own table. This is why, for me, this question of representation, um, we need to pay attention to what extent really the election will be free, fair, and, and transparent. And I think there is no magic. If we want uh, the election to be independent and transparent, we really need to do some steps before jumping into women representation, which is clearly the revision of the current uh, election law that also discriminate women, by the way, the establishment of a constitutional court, and maybe the re-establishment of uh, genuinely independent uh, electoral commission. Uh, because I don't see uh, that women's rights are different from the democracy. You know, I always say that there is no democracy without women's rights and there is no women's rights without democracy. So the, the, the struggle needs to go hand in hand. And I really call on my feminist um, friends and camarades to really think twice about the question of representation and that having more women in dictatorship regime doesn't make any sense because we are com compromising ourselves, we are compromising our values, and actually we are not working uh, for the interest uh, of women. Even though I have to highlight that some women, they get benefit from a little bit of proximity with power, but that's the, not the general case. Thank you very much. Um... You know, I, I have one last question before uh, concluding our webinar, and it's to Hanan. Uh, so my question to you, Hanan, uh, what are the solutions or the plans or activities that the profession of journalism can do to tackle gender disinformation? And I have here in, in, in mind what the special rapporteur said, that a lot of preventive measures could be effective to tackle gender disinformation, like fact-checking, um, ethical journalism, promoting media pl plurality, and other uh, examples. So uh, what do you think? I think there is a work to be done on two sides. The first side is within the, um, the journalistic file uh, itself. So it's within us as a journalist, we need to, uh, to um, make to, to uh, let's say you need to to have a, a better uh, um, uh, exercising of, of of our uh, job as a journalist we need to to do it very well respecting the ethics doing fact checking uh, making media literacy also also to have the public understanding the threatened uh, the the threats that are coming from on the social media. So there is an effort on strengthening our capacity as a journalist, and there is a lot to be done uh, actually to, uh, um, uh, to train journalists to have this uh, competence. So this is something to do inside uh, our, our uh, uh, profession as a journalist. But I think that there is another effort to be done outside our profession. It is uh, something that needs to be done within the civil society, we need to be more uh, uh, solidaire uh, with e each other. We don't need to uh, fight against uh, disinformation, gender disinformation alone. So we don't know, need to have the journalists fighting alone, the feminists fighting, fighting alone, the judges fighting alone. I think that this is uh, it, this is a fight that concern the common fight that concern all of us in this specific context, this, this difficult context, and we need to work together to uh, uh, 
to uh, uh, um, put uh, the, 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 the fingers on the, this, this real problem and to educate people to uh, how, how, how much violence there are that is existing in our society and the public uh, uh, space, and also to make pressure on the um, political power to not uh, go back on the, the what is done as rights and as 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 uh, things good things that we we already realized in the past and to continue to protect them because if we are not acting together we are going to finish by losing uh, all what we we did and to be more and more victims of uh, uh, gender disinformation. Thank you very much, and then um, at the end I would say that. Like two weeks ago in the Human Rights Council, there was a panel on the importance of digital media and information literacy to strengthen the freedom of expression. And the discussion were very much important. So sometimes we can also tackle not only disinformation, but sometimes we have seen that misinformation that people are sharing false uh, information without having the intention to share. And we have seen it in Tunisia, but also elsewhere. And I think it's very important also to spread the culture, the digital literacy, uh, digital, digital education, so that uh, we can train individuals to think critically, to be more resilient, and to be like prudent before sharing information on social media, so they can be the first wall against um, uh, disinformation. So at the end, I would, I would, I would like to thank all the speakers, uh, Lilia, Ikram, Lucina, Sarah, Helen, thank you all. And uh, I hope to see you next time in person to discuss such kind of important uh, thematic. Bye bye. Thank you.